Good morning, everyone. This is Martin Fatilla coming to you on September 11, 2022. Imagine, 21 years have come and gone since the fateful morning about an hour ago. The um, World Trade Center was hit by something flying, it looked like an airplane. I have a 3,000 plus people died in that event. I myself am very much thinking that this was an inside job by the same people or related people who are also the cause behind the epidemic inside job and by all kinds of nefarious things. But that's just me. Um, um, I'm here to question everything because the official narrative of most things is just that. The official narrative that suits the people that are controlling the situation. <clears throat> more and more, it seems to me that the world is run for the benefit of a very few, select few, those that have somehow managed to... Uh, float to the top, even though they're not terribly visible. I'm thinking that the uh, the political theater that we are watching, which is the uh, these parties discussing whether we should uh, go this way or that way, is entirely owned by these controllers anyway. <laughs> I remember Pat Buchanan a few years ago saying, you know, the Republican and the Democratic parties are just the two wings on the same bird of prey. Oof. Anyway, not a very cheerful, cheerful thought. Um, I'm feeling particularly funky about the whole way the world is running because of um, um, the predications or the predictions that, that we're faced with. Um, however, maybe it's like this, maybe the uh, darkest moment of the night is just before the dawn, which that that's what it is. And it's our energies and it's our focus it's, and it's our individual but collective um, activities that will shape the world that we live in. So those that are here and those that you will contact and those that you will interact with, you can be perhaps uh, the example, the beacon of light that um, shapes what's going to happen. And the way this is, is with every action, with every commercial transaction that you make, you're in fact, either supporting something or not supporting something. Meaning this, in the economy, the oxygen is the currency, the money. And wherever you spend your money or whatever you spend your money on is what you support. So that which you buy more of will be made to replace that which was consumed and that you, which will you not spend your money on, will wither. So when you withdraw your support from certain specific uh, agencies or products or activities or whatever it is, uh, that stuff will get less oxygen, less money, and will have to be, well, it will wither. That's how it is. So, of course, the, the whole health space that I operate in, um, or at least that this particular uh, part of my life is focusing on, has to do with what, how we see health and how we see disease. So just a moment ago, I posted a link to um, an article that says Understanding Disease. 
and it was written by a naturopathic doctor, and it gives a very quick overview of the theories of disease. And um, there are essentially two competing ideas. One is known as the germ theory, and the other one is known as the terrain or environment theory. It also was known as the pleomorphism versus monomorphism. And this is quite important. In the monomorphism concept of the world, it says there is a germ and it doesn't change. And the germ comes from outside. In the pleomorphism theory, it says that the uh, microorganism that's within you changes, evolves, mor morphs, modifies, based on the terrain, based on the environment within. To give a nice example of what this looks like is, in an insect, you can watch the insect go through four phases. For example, a butterfly. It starts as an egg that's laid on a leaf and the egg sits there until it's ready to mature enough for a little caterpillar to be born. And that caterpillar spends its time eating and growing and feeding itself and doing what a caterpillar will do. And at the end stage of caterpillar, it will become a chrysalis, a pupa. It will just park itself inside of this thing and wait until it's time for finally the adult, the imago, to emerge. And the butterfly pops out, struggles out of the chrysalis, comes out. And that is the stage that is reproducing, right? Butterfly will mate with another butterfly, male and a female, and they will, the female will end up laying eggs and cycles repeated. Now, if you didn't watch this, if you didn't see the egg turn into the uh, caterpillar and the caterpillar into the pupa and the pupa into the uh, adult, you would not even recognize them. So similarly in a human body, in the pleomorphic view of the world, we can actually see the changes where a, uh, they, they call it microzema, which is just a tiny little particle. Anyway, so this particle will go between viral and bacterial and fungal stages, depending on what's going on inside of the body. And so it is seen as something that will morph within rather than come from without. The monomorphic theory is supported by the prevailing view by the Rockefeller Carnegie uh, medicine that's promoting patented pharmaceutical drugs as treatment. The pleomorphists, they would promote healing, they would promote cure, they would promote finding the root cause and resolving the root cause. It's known as functional medicine and many other branches like naturopathic or herbalist or homeopathic, traditional Chinese, traditional Indian. All these methods are treating a person rather than an illness, which is very different because in the pharmaceutical allopathic medicine, the focus is not on cure, but on treatment. In fact, the, the bottom line would be cure the patient, lose a customer. So what, what they are aiming for, even though they're not telling you that, is that they manage your symptoms well enough that you keep coming for more 
but not so well that you would have to stop or that you would be able to stop coming. And this has been so immensely successful that they have amassed vast amounts of money. And with that, they have bought themselves control. Right now, um, pharmaceutical industries spend more on lobbying the US politicians than all of the other parts of the economy combined. Contemplate that more than chemical, more than oil and uh, oil and gas, more than military, more than, well, anyway, everyone combined doesn't spend as much as the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason they're so rich is because the stuff they make is very cheap to make. It's pennies. It, it probably costs two cents to make, a, I don't know, a Viagra pill that sells for, that sells for $10 each. The bottle that you pay $150 for um, probably costs 75 cents to make as far as the material that's within it. I mean, there's, of course, other expenses, right? But one of the things that the side effects are of this particular situation is that they have vast amounts of money to advertise. And because they are allowed to advertise on television and uh, other media, that's who they end up controlling because of how symbiotic this is. Uh, the television is dependent on the advertiser and the advertiser gets to control what is shown. So previously there used to be some independence of the news channels. It used to be known as public service or community service where the news or the news programs were independent had editorial freedom, but that has gone away. These days, the station manager or owner or whoever they are in charge gets to say, well, this particular report that would show that the pharmaceutical way is either ineffective or downright harmful, we're not going to air that because it would harm their interests and they would not like us for that. And this actually is the same idea as what happens in politics, right? Now that the politician is trying to be re-elected, they need to be um, seeking money. The money, the most money that's available for this sort of thing is with industrial interests and especially with the pharmaceutical. And so when the politician dials for money, they call people who have money and <laughs> They, of course, the implied transaction is, yes, of course, I can give you some money. And when you come calling for more, I will be wondering or I'll be checking with your record how much of a friend you have been to my cause. So I think the only way we can get out of that conundrum will be with, number one, limiting politicians to a single term. And number two, getting rid of the Citizens United decision, which allows free flow of money into politics, money as free speech. And it gets more complex. I guess I'm getting sidetracked. So anyway, on the article, the article that I posted uh, is uh, importantly explaining the history of things. Louis Pasteur, after whom we have pasteurization, uh, promoted the fact that if you kill a germ outside of the body before it gets into the body, it would not be able to infect you. There were two others, Claude Bernard and uh, Antoine Bechamp, all of it in France back in the 1850s, 1880s, France was in fact a super advanced nation at the forefront of the world's uh, ability, scientific and, and industrial and others. Anyway, so the, the other two guys, uh, Bernard and Bechamp, 
we're saying that no, it's the terrain that matters. The terrain decides whether a, an external event will or will not have an internal effect. To give an exact example is this. You may remember a flu epidemic, like from years ago. Um, a flu comes to the school and in the classroom of 30 children, 10 will get ill and 20 will not. We call it an epidemic and the flu is all over the place and everybody, quote unquote, is getting the flu. No, only a third was getting the flu. Two thirds were not. But because we focus on the threats, because we have this bias for danger, I guess that's that's the inherent nature of our human psychology and our human existence, is that we focus on on a threat, right? We enlarge it. It seems bigger than it really is. Anyway, um, explain to me why 10 children got it and 20 did not. What was different about the 20 that did not get the flu? Another recent example is this uh, coronavirus, which just blew through the society. And we had a gigantic amount of news reports and panic generated from it. And yet most people were asymptomatic even though they were infected, quote unquote, they didn't have symptoms. So the people with symptoms, the people with illness, we postulate, are the ones whose internal terrain is such that it allows for this illness or the symptoms to flourish, which again supports the theory of the terrain. That is, if the garden is ready, the plant will grow, right? I mean, this is a kind of a weird example, but I throw a seed into soil, into the soil somewhere. And if the conditions are right, the plant will grow and uh, we'll see it in full bloom. But if the conditions are not, then nothing happens. So in some sense, I could be the infection, infections desert right? Nothing will grow in me as long as my internal terrain is right. And that is dependent, believe it or not, on a strong mixed microbiome. We had conversations about that and you can actually um, come to Life Enthusiast, life-enthusiast.com, click on podcasts and look up the recent podcasts with uh, Spencer Feldman about the nature of our microbiome and the seven ways in which we can strengthen it. And it goes quite deep in explaining how having a lot of microbes in the body with the correct support, which we have identified as uh, oligosaccharides, because that's what they need for their nourishment, their function, um, how that actually will maintain a healthy inner terrain that will be strong enough to resist the incoming fire or the, well, whatever, whatever threat we may perceive, right? And so um, somebody asked me just the other day about shedding. And I, I have to, had to give it a thought, just how does shedding work, right? And it's, I am here sitting with you face to face. Well, this is an electronic example of it, but if we were close face to face with one another, whatever's going on inside of me, I'm exhaling. So the stuff that's inside me comes out of me either as aerosolized or spits little droplets or whatever it is. And of course, if I, uh, I uh, went to the toilet and didn't wash my hands properly. I would also come back with whatever's coming out of my, uh, well, some feces will end up on my fingers and my fingers, I'll touch something, surface or the person 
exchanges will happen, right? And if we get intimate with one another, all kinds of bodily fluids will get, get exchanged. So whatever's going inside of me is reported into you, and whatever's inside of you is coming to me. So we're communicating. That's how we exchange. Now, virology tells us that a virus um, cannot reproduce on its own. It requires that it borrows the host's cells, takes over some cells in order to reproduce itself. So, of course, by rule or by definition, it has to be mutating because in order to just reproduce inside of me, it has to borrow parts of me. So whatever's in me will be coming out of that. Okay, so that's, <laughs> where am I going with that? I am saying that uh, the, uh, the virus exchanges do happen, but they only happen when the host is uh, willing to be in that trade. So going forward, we have this concept of the Koch postulates. That was basically dealing with bacterial illnesses, like it would work for tuberculosis or gonorrhea or whatever. And uh, that the whole idea of the postulates, there were four, was that number one, um, whatever's in the sick um, subject, animal, person, has to be not in the healthy person. So it has to exclude. Two, we should be able to isolate that which is in the sick. Three, we should be able to take that and put it into the healthy one and make it sick. And four, we should be able to take that um, sick person, extract and isolate that and compare it back to the beginning. And it should be the identical creature. So this will, for example, be demonstrable in case of gonorrhea or syphilis or tuberculosis, because those are, in fact, microbes that will infect and attack. However, it's only the weak ones that will succumb. You have to be somehow damaged, either by parasites or by inadequate nutrition or by presence of toxins. At least that would be the, the baseline, right? Now, there have been modifications. Modern virology says, well, yeah, you can't just take this like at cautious postulates because we now have everybody encountering a particular microbe and it's in many people and only some of it, some of them will um, display the symptoms of the illness. And that's the whole core of it. That's the whole core of the argument. Once they admit to that, that you can have a microbe within you, but not have any symptoms, it will give argument to the concept of the pleomorphism or the, to the concept of the terrain rather than the germ being important. Germs are everywhere. It's the internal state of the body that will determine the outcome. And so with that, the entire concept of vaccination is completely wrong-headed because inserting an illness into the body is not the way to prevent it. It would follow that if we make the body strong, if we make the immune system well, if we make the body healthy, we are going to end up with better outcomes. Hmm. And so this is actually going back into the beginnings, right? Where 
most vaccines were introduced after World War II, after 1940. And yet most of the communicable diseases that we are defending against were mostly eradicated by that time. The famous one, polio, uh, seems to have coincided strangely with the introduction of DDT. And then when DDT was taken off the market, the rates dropped dramatically. And now we're just seeing some cases of polio, but they're only the um, vaccination strain of polio. So it's people who have been vaccinated for with the polio vaccine who have now experienced some crazy health challenges that will um, experience the illness or get sick with it. Anyway, so there's more to this article that I posted. You can probably read it. Um, one other piece in there is uh, uh, pointing to Dr. Royal Lee, who um, postulated the natural killer antibodies, which are mm, the cause of the cytokines and cytokine storms. Well, we have learned that expression not long ago. And, and uh, autoimmune disease, right? Like in, in his day, he called it protomorphology, which would be something that just screws up within you, right? Well, indeed, that, that happens. And uh, we have now started calling it, or, rate, or lately it's been called autoimmunity. Autoimmune disease is when your body is creating storms of antibodies that are attacking not only something foreign, but the stuff that, that we're made of, things that we want. So that's that's pretty, well, how do I say that? The largest amount of suffering other than through accidents and wounds and, you know, whether it's a car accident or fall or a gunshot or something like that, which is a traumatic injury, most every other illness is of the chronic inflammatory um, age-related degenerative disease. And these include cancer, uh, cardiovascular, like blood pressure or heart attack or um, arthritis, diabetes, and so on. A lot of these illnesses, well, all of these illnesses are inflammatory in their nature and are primarily caused by a lot of lifestyle, our not being healthy enough to not get sick. And so that's, yeah, we wear out with time, right? We shouldn't have to, or I don't know what the plan is for this body, whether I'm supposed to be living 120 years, or if there's this biblical design where Methuselah and uh, his uh, sons and family lived 900 years. Um, in order for that to be true, we need to be ingesting the kind of stuff that is needed to sustain the body and not ingesting the stuff that uh, is making things worse, right? I came up with these four words, which was toxicity, malnutrition, stagnation, and trauma. And toxicity was presence of things that shouldn't be inside or coming. Malnutrition is absence of things that we require but aren't present. Stagnation is lack of movement, lack of uh, dynamic balance. We, we humans are supposed to be not in static balance, but in dynamic balance. 
like breathing, for example, right? Inhale, exhale. I need something in, but I need to give something back. Food. I ingest something and then at the end I get rid of the waste and so on, right? Dynamic. A static balance would be something like a nice statue, right? Like a marble statue, perfect in every way, but unchangeable, not moving, fixed. In a dynamic balance, I'm able to interact with my environment, exchange, and grow, mature, evolve, that sort of uh, approach. Uh, something that's in static balance, maybe a piece of art, a beautiful work, but it's unchanging. All right, so uh, if we want evolution, if we want uh, to increase anything, we need to be in dynamic balance, which will require us to interact with the environment and each other and so on. Well, here's, here's uh, Dr. Lee. He listed major contributing causes to the autoimmune process as starvation of the organ, poison, toxicity, xenobiotics, which would be unnatural foreign substances, carcinogens, infection, dehydration, hormone imbalances, and drug addictions. And um, the balance that's required uh, is dependent on the pH, and you probably have read or heard a lot that alkalize or die, you must be alkalizing and whatever. It's not as simple as that. There's a narrow range at around 7.35, which is a little ways off the 7.0, which is the neutral. Anything less than seven is alkali, sorry, acidic. Anything higher than seven is uh, alkaline. And if you measure it on uh, with, uh, with a voltmeter, it's uh, negative 25 millivolt where the sweet spot is, just slightly alkaline. So if you become overly acidic, certain problems develop. If you become overly alkaline, other problems will develop. They're not the same, but there they are. So depending on how far off balance your terrain is, you will be developing problems. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just reading now on screen the uh, part two of the article, which you can go read it. Um, what, what we're going after is the fact that since the uh, Industrial Revolution started, which was around 1820s, well, it started in about 1780 in, in Europe, 1820 it got going, and by 1880 we had a railroad connecting one end of the country with the other, and chemical industries, and uh, uh, oil and gas industries and all of that started evolving, right? But especially after World War II, when the use of a nitrogen fertilizer came to vogue, we started seeing dramatic decline in nutrient density in food and dramatic increase in environmental pollution. And as that increases with each succeeding generation, we are more toxic, and we have more of these illnesses. And the technology is trying to say, we will come up with a technology solution for this, right? The, the pharmaceutical drugs are saying, oh, well, take another. Like best example that I can come up with lately would be the vaccination for the coronavirus. First, it was 
take this shot and you will not get sick. Well, no, take two shots and you will not get sick. Oh, well, no, no, you will just have lesser symptoms. You will not die. Well, uh, yeah, you may die, but uh, you know what I'm getting with it? And and as it mutates, because it has to mutate, that's that's the nature of the beast. Uh, they're telling you that you now have to take another shot and another shot and another shot to try and chase this tail of, um, of a forever mutating microbes. When in fact, the answer was in keeping the body whole, keeping the body free of toxins, well hydrated, well balanced, and filled with nutrients. If you had that in place, if you had a healthy microbiome and nutrient density and uh, a complete innate immune system, you would in fact be resilient and resistant, which is actually what was the story for most people. Remember? Majority of people were asymptomatic. Only a few were symptomatic. It's nature's way of weeding out the few, the weeding out the weak. Like I don't, I don't mean to be mean to anyone, but just to give nature example. In Africa, on the savanna, there are gazelles and there are lions. And when lions go hunting, they just go after the weakest, either the one with a broken leg or the one that's limping behind or the one that just can't run as fast as the rest of the, the herd. That's the ones that get caught and eaten. And that's, that's the way of natural dynamic balance. Those that are well fitted or well suited for the environment thrive and the others don't. The, one, the weak ones are taken off out of circulation. So from an individual perspective, that's pretty awful because just, for example, myself, right? If it weren't for the technology, I probably wouldn't have survived. I probably would have been one of the infants who did not make um, puberty or adulthood if it were not for the intervention that that I received, medical care, right? But what's interesting is my children are actually worse off genetically than I am. So they are in fact, having more problems than I'm having. And I certainly am having more problems than my parents' generation was having. And many, many of you will probably uh, uh, notice that while our parents lived into their 90s and mostly okay, or at least that's, that's a common example, uh, these days we're less well, at least my generation, and then people who are in their 30s or so, they're now coming up with illnesses that we used to call old age. Well, they're getting them at productive age. So that's that's the big problem here. That's the challenge. What is that challenge? The accumulation of toxins, whether they are additives, chemicals, I mean, the number of chemicals that have been introduced in just the last 80 years is staggering. So the environmental pollution, soil depletion, that's, that's what gives rise to these chronic degenerative autoimmune diseases. So here's a definition. Disease is a result of the body's innate reaction to preserve itself, manifested as symptoms 
when its nutritive and immune powers have been diminished, which elicits a secondary cascade of microorganisms from within or from without, or failing that, a tertiary cascade of anti antibodies. Allergic responses stand as an alternative guardian and a signal. Nature inexorably moves forward. This is by Dr. Cordell Logan, who, I don't know, he may have retired. He started practicing in Utah in 1981. So 40 years, yeah, he'd be probably about the age now to retire. Anyway, very insightful, insightful article. I would encourage you to read it, contemplate it, and just orient your life and your wallet and how you spend your money in the way that that's focusing on supporting things that are worth having and not supporting things that are not. Which takes me back to 911, which was a fine example of the controllers doing stuff right in front of our eyes, allowing us to even look at the theater and then just totally shifting the narrative. How is it possible that the fellow that bought the buildings took out a $2 billion insurance policy in the event of a uh, terrorist attack? How is it possible that they pulled down the building number seven in a controlled demolition that looked exactly like the Trade Center 1 and 2. Why are we not even talking about that? I mean, there's more. I don't want to get conspiratorial other than the official version that we have been presented is total bunk. How is it possible that the CEO of the company, whose office was on the floor where the airplane hit, was away visiting with the Bush family. I think it was the elder Bush. I mean, the coincidences go like so deep so far. How is it possible that somebody took out a large short on airlines, like a huge blip. Somebody knew something was coming. That 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 short went uncollected. They must have realized that if they tried to collect on it, it will be clearly visible that they knew ahead of time. Anyway, hmm. a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. The society was changed in. Uh, reaction to it because the uh, the political reaction to this was over the top to this day we are putting up with um, going through um, airport support security checks which accomplish nothing just harassing us anyway blah blah martin's uh, <laughs> On a rant. So as far as your health goes, don't inhale collapsing building dust. It'll make you sick. On a political side, I mean, we see all kinds of articles coming through and um, I don't want to get into that on this forum, but uh, let, let me just say it as the, the show that we're presented is not really what's really going on. The stuff you see on television, the stuff you are seeing in the Congress, that's not really what's running the show. Okay. Um, do I need to repeat myself? Did this matter? Did it make any difference to you? Are we, uh, are we helping? 
Decide how you want to spend your money. Be very judicious with that. Um, yeah, Laurie, so sorry that uh, I didn't notice that you're, uh, you're telling me that my volume was low. People were saying that it sounded okay. So, damn it. I could have pulled the microphone closer, right? Which I just did. Um, any questions? Any comments? Anything out there? Uh, you can see in the different background that uh, I am actually not at my regular place. I'm currently visiting with my daughter and her family, which is kind of fun. We have uh, two grandsons. They're small, six months and three years. And it's it's actually fun to do that. So I get to have some pleasures in my <laughs> in my uh, 70th year by uh, seeing the, the next generation rising with the hopes that we help them grow up strong and grow up resilient and that the world that they live in is not going to be as much of a disaster as it's looking to be. Who knows? All right, my friends, I see no one typing anything. Oh, something. All right. Um, listen, I would like to hear from you what you're interested in. I mean, this this day I get to be particularly mournful because the uh, the nine one one anniversary brings up a lot of thoughts for me, a lot of concerns, and a lot of uh, memories of just how messed up the society is. I'll share with you this. This is off the off the trail, off the topic, but it's like this. In May of 2001, a uh, project called the Disclosure Project dot org. Look it up. Disclosure Project dot org. Uh, Dr. Stephen Greer came up with uh, about 400 affidavits of various people and a press conference with 27 upstanding citizens, all of whom were standing up to say, listen, the suppression of the um, existence of and contact with extraterrestrials that have been visiting here, that are here, and uh, is available, has been sequestered and suppressed and hidden. For example, we have had the electrogravitic technology, power generation available to us since the 1960s. Not only did we never need fossil fuels, we didn't even need roads. That whole thing is just a charade controlled by the, the ones who have simply run off with the power in this society. And we somehow tacitly have played along. Look it up. Anyway, in May of 2021, this was going public and it was going to make big waves. But four months later, we had the... Uh, airplanes into the World Trade Center, and all of a sudden that whole narrative just got taken away. Hmm. Again, if we could put focus on that, right? if we could focus on what matters, if we could focus ourselves correctly in the world of finance and not support the big banks, and not support the uh, activities that we don't agree with and disinvest. I mean, this is 
probably not the place, right? Because most people who are spending time here with me probably are not decision makers about where a billion or a trillion of dollars is going to be invested. But if you were, you have a lot of responsibility because wherever you place your money, whatever you place it on, that's what you're supporting. Um, there, there's a there's a parable. I forget which. I think it was uh, Navajo, but I don't know. It's 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 a native story. And the young boy says, "Grandfather, I have inside of me two wolves. One is dark and angry and malevolent, and the other one is light and kind and loving. And they seem to be fighting with one another." Which one of them will prevail? And grandfather's answer was, the one you feed. That's a wonderful metaphor. Think of it in so many ways. That which you feed in your body, that which you feed in your family, in your community, in the economy. Be conscious. Thank you very much. This is Martin Patella on September 9, September 11, 2022. You can find me at life-enthusiast.com and by phone at 866-543-3388.